This story has been recorded at an Addictive Eaters Anonymous meeting in New Zealand. You can email us at contact at aeanz.org. Um, and yeah, as I said, it's a uh, speaker meeting and tonight's speaker is Carla. Saying that gives me time to think about what to say next, but also I do mean it. You know, I'm so grateful that um, I'm not eating today, that I have a solution, and that um, you know I get to share my experience and you know the strength that I've found in these rooms, and you know that maybe that can give somebody some hope. Um, so um, I haven't had to think much about what I'm going to say tonight because my story doesn't change. And um, you know, I was just thinking about that in the respect that I'm really glad that it doesn't change. It's good. It's um, it's just my experience. So as far back as I can remember, I was fascinated by food. And that was what the first person who I spoke to from these rooms, that was what she said to me. She said that as far back as she could remember, she was fascinated by food. And I just was, just that one sentence just completely had me hooked. Because I just somehow knew that she knew. And that was my experience. I can still, still to this day, close my eyes and picture our family's pantry, where the containers that things were kept in, where everything was kept, and where the good stuff was, you know. And the good stuff for me were the biscuits, and especially the ones that had the pink icing in the hundreds of thousands. And they were on the top right-hand shelf, interestingly, right beside all the medicines. So <laughs> all the medicines were up there too. So. I would often take a biscuit and try whatever was, <laughs> and I was little. I remember like taking a half of like an inhaler that was up there and you know all sorts of things and, and I was little because I had to climb, I had to climb to get to that shell and, um, and I just, I wanted to know when and where and what we were eating and how we were going to eat it and what was in it and what we were going to have next, and what we were going to have, and if I loved it, when we were going to have it again, um, it was just, it just consumed me. Um, I would sit cross-legged in front of the oven, waiting for things to, um, to bake, and, um, you know, I've heard people in this room, in these rooms talk about eating, your baking in every form. And so, you know, if you hung around the kitchen while there was baking going on, you know, you usually got to lick the bowl. And, um, you know, then there might be, you know, some other opportunity to eat. I don't know, when you put the raisins in the baking, then you can grab a couple of raisins out. And then just, you know, how many times I, you know, the other thing was, no patience around food, so I just I just couldn't wait for it, and so just the agony of watching something bake. But you know, biscuits didn't usually take that long. But then the agony of having to wait for it to cool down, and just not actually even being able to wait for it to cool down, and just you know how long it's been since I've had that sensation of eating something too quick, that's too hot, and burning the roof of your mouth. And then getting that thing where all the skin comes off the top of your mouth. And, you know, I just, that was, that was regular for me. Like, that wasn't a, oh, every now and again I had, it was regularly that I would have a burnt top of my mouth just because I couldn't wait for food. My mother only ever bought us those ice, ice popsicles once. Because you bought them not frozen. And... 
they were in the things and you'd, you'd, top, you'd you know, take the top off and they'd just be these long, thin things. Maybe it was a North Island thing, everybody's looking a bit blank. Um, you'd, you'd buy them not frozen and then you'd put them in the freezer and you'd, you'd have to wait for them to freeze. I couldn't wait for them to freeze. And I'd be going into the freezer like every two seconds and my mother was just like, you know, by the time, you know, she was, she was just so over it. So, consequently, with all that eating, and it didn't have to be good stuff, I was just thinking that too, you know, um, I had kids' sisters, and they often had rusks, um, you know, and they were good for sucking on, and that would do, and then we always, we often grew up in the Waikato, and we often had um, lambs that we were, that we were looking after, and, you know, the lamb's milk powder, you know, <laughs> that'd do. It was sweet and you know disgusting, and you know it was one teaspoon for the for the bottle, and then one teaspoon for me. Um, oh, I just I can't even imagine now. I mean, oh. but you know it just didn't matter. Consequently, um, overweight as a child, all my life overweight. Um, my father called me his baby elephant, and um, it was as much about the way that. I, you know, my weight, but it was also the way I carried myself around the house. I did stomp a lot and um, felt like it was my domain. Um, my, my parents were very young when they had me and when my sisters were born, I was four when my, my sister was born and then six when my other sister was born. They basically belonged to me in my mind and um, I was very possessive with them, um, and had a lot of demands, had a lot of demands. Um, didn't like being overweight, probably became aware of it probably when I was about nine or ten I guess, became aware of being overweight, and so it would have been about that time when I started on my first diet, you know, that first time where I drew the graph, the graph, the graph with the you know, my weight on this side, vertical side, and the weeks on this side, on the horizontal side, and, you know, weighing myself every week, and, um, you know, colouring colouring it in, because, you know, every week you want your bar graph to be going down, and then doing the line, and then the goal, wherever the goal was, for whatever what it was, whether it was a a new dress or, a, you know, for something or somebody's wedding or, you know, whatever it was, you know, I had 10 weeks and I had 10 kilos to lose and, you know, that graph would be up on the fridge and it was supposed to make a difference. <laughs> and actually, you know, I'm quite target focused and, and actually, you know, I, I could diet, you know, and I, I did diet from that very young age and, you know, um, Every year I would diet and lose weight, and every year, you know, what, it was either I was on a diet or I was off a diet. My weight was either going down or going up. You know, there was never a steady pace. There was never a steady place for me. It was either always going down or always going up. And, you know, those diets, crazy. Some of them were crazy. Um... You know, some of them would, you know, be basically starving. Some of them would be eating the same thing for a whole day. So for one day, I'd eat all cheese. And then the next day, I'd eat all bread. And the next day, I'd eat all fruit. And then the next day, I'd eat all vegetables. Like, it was... I think back, and I was thinking, you know, that's weird. But anyway. Um, yeah. Um, I was... I was the one who cut my hair before one of my, my weigh-ins. I know somebody else has done it in this room as well, but I did that one time. I, um, I cut my hair before a weigh-in because I thought that would make a difference that week. <laughs> or I'd, you know, start off weighing myself with my boots and then start taking my boots off. And, uh, you know, just... I don't know who I was kidding. I don't know who I was kidding. And, um, yeah, that was my life, um, with the food and with the weight. And then there was the way I was, and, you know, I alluded to it before about, you know, that 
the way I carried myself around the house, but, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm an extrovert, most definitely. I am um, not somebody who was shy or, um, you know, had a had problem, anxiety around people. Um, I had anxiety, I definitely had anxiety, but most of my anxiety was about failure to succeed. If I couldn't get 100%, 100%, if I couldn't be A plus in everything, then I, that for me, like a, a B plus for me was a failure. Um, so I had a lot of anxiety about being, being the best, being seen to be the best. Um, and I worked really hard at that and I also cheated, you know, I would cheat in exams, not to pass, I knew I could pass on my own, but I would cheat in exams to get an A+, plus. Um, and that's, that's what I was like, um, you know, people talk about being a social cripple, I always have a laugh at that because I, I do think I was a social elephant, I would walk in the room and expect everybody's eyes to be on me, and I would go around and leave havoc in my wake because I would say things without a filter. I would say things that would hurt people and I would I would again demanding, you know, I was just a very still can be a very demanding person. And um, yeah, and really the friends that I had were people that I would like I would, I would do a lot for them so that they would be my friend. Like I would, I, I couldn't, uh, yeah, I would help them to study or I would, um, you know, steal money, steal money and buy things for them or steal money and buy food and alcohol for them or, you know, whatever. Um, so when... I was about, um, I met my partner when we were 17, 18, and um, he's now my husband, and he came along for the ride. He was the sort of person that would hold my hair back while I was vomiting after we'd been out drinking, and um, he was just, he, was clean, he would always clean up my messes for me. Um, the first time I met him, I sat on a trestle table and broke it, and that was my weight. And um, he just quietly picked it up and put it away. And I thought, well, "There's a keeper." So <laughs> took him hostage. Not literally. I said that once in a in a high school class. I said, "You know, I took my husband hostage." And, and they all thought I meant literally that I took him hostage. <laughs> Did not literally take him hostage. But as I say, he came along for the ride. So, um, yeah. How did I get to these rooms? That just kept on getting worse. Um, every year, the amount of weight that I would have to lose to get to my goal weight would just increase and increase and increase. You know, I'd lose 10 kilos and put another 20 kilos on and then the next year I'd lose 20 kilos and put another 30 kilos on and I, you know, swore black and blue that I would never get over 70 kilos and then I swore black and blue that I'd never get over 80 kilos and I swore black and blue that I'd never get over 90, 100. I stopped weighing myself at 100. I think, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, at some point I just had to stop weighing myself. Um... On the way here tonight, I saw a woman in a car driving who was very overweight. And that reminded me of what it was like for me driving because I was so, I was so overweight that um, I had trouble fitting in between the chair and the steering wheel because I'm short <laughs> and my legs are really short. So I couldn't, to be able to reach the pedals, I needed to have my, my seat forward. But to be able, but then I would be hitting the steering wheel. And because I had my seat forward, I would have trouble getting my safety belt 
across across the seat that was pushed forward to get across. I would just I just that was that's the realities, the you know, some of the realities of that physical side of thing that, that overweight. And yet still I I just I I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore. So um, my husband and I were due to get married. Um, oh, three things happened before that. Three things happened, and those things were Princess Diana died. So this is how long ago it was. It was about 20 years ago now. Princess Diana died, and I just remember that my reaction to that was completely over the top. Like I didn't know Princess Diana. I didn't know, but you know, like I, I'm not that close to her. Um, you know, but I just. I just, I lost the plot, you know, like it just completely threw me. And I knew that my reaction to it was out of kilter, but I didn't know how to stop that reaction. Um, my husband and I had a car accident. This was in Auckland. And again, my reaction to it, I, um, I've never considered myself to be someone who was aggressive or, you know, and I think the food helped with that a lot. The food kind of calmed me down a lot. It was my sedation. But on that particular occasion, this woman drove into us, and I was I was I, I got terrible bruising all over my my upper body. But I just remember feeling like I was going to punch her. You know, like there was such an overwhelming sensation of anger, and I and I just I thought I was going to punch her. And then after that, I got put into an ambulance. And they strapped me into the ambulance, and of course I'm, you know, very overweight by this stage. And we we went up these really steep Auckland hills, and I was strapped to the Guernsey, strapped in the in the ambulance, and all I could think was, it's going to give way. <laughs> the Guernsey's going to give way, and I'm going to end up going through the doors and careering down the hill. Like it was just like I was just. We didn't get to see the Crusaders play that night. That's where we were going off to see the rugby. And then my parents' marriage split up. So my, marriage split up. my parents' marriage, they've been married for nearly 25 years and their, their marriage ended, our marriage ended, and their marriage, our marriage, their marriage ended and my father left, our, our family just left. Um, he had a, another relationship and another and it had been going on for about six or seven years and there was a lot of deceit and it was it, it, it just and again I just I felt like my life was shattered and I went to see a counsellor because of my dad and for three sessions I talked to her about my horrible father my father this my father that and blah 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 and after three sessions with this particular very nice counsellor I, I rang her and I said, thank you so much. I feel so much better now that I've told you all about my horrible father. Um, I don't need to come back and see you. And she said to me, Carla, I'm really worried about you. I want you to come back and I want us to talk about you. And I hung up on her. I hung up on her because I didn't want to talk about me. I, I was doing just fine. I was fine and I was keeping it all together and I was fine. And um, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Um, by this stage, with the dieting, I didn't have another diet in me. I just knew I couldn't diet anymore. And I didn't know. I, I just, I didn't know how I was going to end up. It wasn't going to end up like I saw this movie called Who's Eating Gilbert Grape. And, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know how I was not going to be like that woman who sat in the car and the whole car tilted. <laughs> and that, you know, rather than having a burial, they burnt the house down. You know, I didn't know how I wasn't going to be like that. And I would have to eat so much at night to be able to go to sleep. You know, that, that to knock my, I needed to knock myself out with the food every night. Because if I didn't, then I would go to bed crying. And this was beside my you know, husband-to-be, he wouldn't hear it, I didn't want him to hear it. But if I hadn't had enough to eat, I would go to bed and I would imagine cutting off bits of my body, you know, what bits had to go, and how I could miraculously, I just wanted to wake up the next morning, you know, a normal weight, that's, that's all I wanted. 
and I could, I, uh, my whole life was geared around me trying to control my, my eating. So, you know, I couldn't walk up to the bus stop that was up the top of our road because to do that I would have to pass the bakery that was open early in the morning, so I couldn't even leave earlier than the, what the bakery was open because I couldn't walk past the bakery. And then, because the, the bus stop, cause if I did get past the bakery, the bus stop was out the dairy, outside the dairy, so I didn't know how I could be outside the dairy without going into the dairy. And so then I'd get my husband to drop me off on his way to work at a bus stop that was outside a bookshop because I could be outside a bookshop and not eat. But then the problem was what bus stop to get off at on Queen Street when I got into town at work because the one closest to my work was right outside of Mrs Higgins cookie time, cookie place and they sold white chocolate and macadamia <coughs> nut cookies and I couldn't not have a white chocolate and macadamia nut cookie. And, you know, I would, um, I would buy that cookie and I'd say, this is going to be for morning tea. And the problem was that I worked on the eighth floor and most of the people got out of the lift on the fourth floor. And so between the fourth floor and the eighth floor, I would eat the cookie. And so then I didn't have any morning tea and I'd have to go down and get morning tea. Like it, was just, it was just never ending. It was just never ending and I was completely over it. And um, it was New Year's and, um, and I was getting ready to get married to my husband and we came down from Auckland to Christchurch um, to plan our wedding, which we were getting married here in Christchurch and, um, and it was just awful. It was an awful Christmas because it was our first Christmas without our father and it was an awful, awful New Year's because various family members ended up in hospital one way or another because of alcohol and drugs. And we were doing family counselling and we were planning our, my wedding with Clark, our wedding. And, you know, I've shared it before, I hated the size 24 wedding dresses. They were just pretty hideous. Had sunflowers on the boobs and sort of big ruffles, and but I just didn't know. I just didn't know how to. I, I didn't. I couldn't. I didn't have another diet in me. <coughs> and um, that's when um, yeah, I heard about a, a number of things happen. I heard about you know this fellowship for food, the twelve steps. I had met. I, I had seen. I had seen come on, someone come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I had seen that person change, you know, just completely change. And he was scary. You know, before he came to, this, to AA, he was scary. And after he came into AA, he just changed. And he was kind and he came and pruned my lemon tree in my flat. You know, so that, that, it, I'd seen that, I'd seen that change. And um, there was a sudden realisation for me because I thought that, you know, alcohol and drugs were terrible. Even though I drank a lot and every time I drank I got drunk, I couldn't, I couldn't see that because it was, wasn't every weekend. And so I thought I was really good because at New Year's I didn't, I didn't get drunk and end up in hospital and I didn't do drugs. And... I just remember this one, I was, you know, judging others and I just had remembered having like this, almost like a blight, almost like a blinding light because I remember I was on the Wood Ave and I had to stop the car. I had to stop the car because I realised that where those people had had their alcohol and their drugs, on that New Year's I had had my chocolate and I had had my food and that I was doing exactly the same thing as them with the food as they'd been doing with the alcohol and the drugs. I made a New Year's resolution at that New Year's to never eat chocolate again, to stop eating chocolate. And um, so that was that was going to be my New Year's resolution and that's what happened, but um, we 
were at the hospital and I was driving home and it was after midnight, but we drove past it, I, I was on my own, I drove past a service station and it said three chocolate bars for two dollars and I couldn't not stop, you know, I had to stop, I got those three chocolate bars and I ate them in the car on, on that night even though it was past midnight because in my head it was like, no, the New Year's resolution doesn't start until the next morning. That's how I justified it in my head. And um, that, that, that was it. That was the last time I had chocolate, actually, for me. Um, I came into this fellowship on, it must have been about the 13th of January. Um, and I hadn't had chocolate in that time. And then, um, yeah, I met, I met this person who talked about being fascinated with food. And, you know, um, she read the big book to me. And I, then I started reading the big book, and I just started going to meetings, and I just followed her. Um, we 12 steeped to a lot of people, and you know, I, I lost weight. Um, I was on a food plan, I lost weight, I lost a lot of weight. And you know, a year later at my wedding, I didn't get married in a size 22 wedding dress, 24 wedding dress. And there was a bunch of you here that are here that were there at my wedding. And, um, yeah, and I thought that was it. I thought that was the point. I thought, I thought, I thought actually that I was God's gift to all of you and you were so lucky to have me. Um, but it took me, it took me a lot longer than that. It took me nearly 10 years after that um, to actually get to that point of really asking for help in every area of my life. Um, I'm very independent, I always have been very independent, as I said when I was age four and my sister was born, I thought, oh you don't need to be my parent anymore, I can take care of myself. Very independent, very self-sufficient, and um, you know, for me, I saw the 12 steps, and I thought, oh that's alright, 12 steps, 12 weeks, I'll get some new stationery, and I will have this thing sorted, and then I'll teach all of you, I'll get A plus again, and I'll teach all of you how to do it. And um, it says um, in the third step in the big book that we are beyond human aid. And I knew that when I came in. I, I knew that falling in love with my husband had only given me a reprieve for about a week. And my mother couldn't save me, and my father couldn't save me, and you know, all of the other things that I tried, the counsellors, all of that. You know, I knew I was beyond human aid, but I forgot that I was a human being and that I can't fix myself. I cannot fix myself. My life is unmanageable by me. And um, I, needed, I needed the help of my sponsor. I needed to work those 12 steps in every area of my life. And, you know, it took what it took. And for me, it, it was in that I, I kept on picking up the first one. But for me also, it was in the way that I still led my life, you know, in that controlling way in that demanding way, in that way of, of leaving havoc wherever I went, went and expecting others to perform to my liking rather than to, you know, like I just, I didn't have, I didn't, I wasn't a nice person to live with. So um, ultimately what saved my life was my um, sponsor, um, demanding, expecting, suggesting isn't right, <laughs> um, that I do another step four and step five, and that step four and step five that I did with her completely floored me, completely floored me because who I thought I was and who I was when I put it down on paper um, to share with her were two completely, completely different things. Um, you know, as I say, I thought I was God's gift to you all. I thought I was amazing, I thought I was generous, I thought I was kind, and all of it was self. I was just completely full of self. And, um, you know, it just, I had a concept of a higher power when I came here, but it was a concept of a Santa Claus. You know, God was Santa Claus who was going to give me everything that I wanted as I wanted. 
my prayers in the morning where, God, please stretch the time because I've got all of these things that I want to do today. And um, that's not what it's like today. Um, a very patient sponsor would just say to me, go out there, go help someone else. Every day she would say that to me. And even today, you know, she reminded me, God's in charge, Carla. Go out there, go help someone else. This morning, this morning, I was about to go into a deep, dark pit of despair. I was just headed in that direction. And she just pulled me up and she said, God's in charge. Go out there, go help someone else. And so, you know, we read it in our preamble today. You know, we have the ability today to lead, you know, happy and productive lives. And it's good, it's good, it's good in every area of my life. I get, you know, to be of use to others and not wreak that havoc. You know, like, maybe not make things better for everybody, but at least not making things worse. You know, I'm not making things worse. And, um, and I'm really grateful for that. These steps have saved my life. These meetings have saved my life. I've, you know, I've been given everything, everything that I have. And, um, and I'm very grateful, so thank you. Mm.